right, so in this video, I'm going to describe a tube or a pair of tubes that are responsible for the transmission of urine down to the urinary bladder, which is the main temporary reservoir for the urine. The, naturally, these tubes are connecting the factory to the reservoir. The factories of urine production are the two kidneys, and the reservoir is the urinary bladder. So the, these tubes are known as the ureters, right and left ureters. Okay, I want on this on this model. I want you to appreciate the close relationship and where the position of the ureters, just like the kidneys. The ureters are also lying behind the peritoneum, so they are retroperitoneal structures. Very long tubes have to travel down a long way, five centimeters almost uh, in the, uh, mm, mm, not five, it's like a, a roughly five inches uh, uh, in the abdomen and then this almost the same length in the pelvis, because pelvis is the deep uh, cavity. All right, so you can see these two ureters, they originate from the pelvis of the kidney, or renal pelvis, which is lying at the hilus, or the doorway, okay? The, the pelvis continues itself as the elongated tube, which is the ureter, and these ureters are lying in close proximity, or they are, I would say rather they are lying on the two muscles, the suas major muscles. So they are in contact with the suas fa fascia also, okay? They descend down, have been crossed by vessels because they are lying on either side of the largest two blood vessels of our body, the abdominal descending aorta and the inferior vena cava. And of course, the branches which are emerging out of the aorta will be coming in contact with these tubes. And also the veins which are dumping their blood into the inferior vena cava will, be, will also be coming in contact. So the ureters, they travel down and then they cross the pelvic brim or the pelvic inlet to enter the pelvic cavity. Ultimately, they enter the, in this model, you can't see the, the intra-pelvic course of the ureters. So I'll be using another model. So you just have to keep in mind that the ureters, once they enter the pelvis, they go deep down till the level of the floor of pelvis, and then they, they open up or they enter the, through the walls of the urinary bladder and dump their product into the bladder, okay? It's a, it's a muscular tube, thick muscular tube, made, up, made out of, uh, you know, layers and layers of smooth muscle, which are not under voluntary control. All right, so here is the other model. And it's much more clear because the, the surrounding structures, the posterior body wall, everything is missing, and you can focus on the tubes. The yellow colored pipes are representing the ureters. Once they enter the pelvis after crossing the pelvic brim and also the vessels, the internal iliac vessels, they are like, by the way, this is a model of a male uh, system because this, this structure is, the, is rep representing the bladder, urinary bladder. So here, they, the ureters, once they enter the pelvic cavity, they go deep down and they open up or they, they traverse through the wall of muscular wall of the urinary bladder from behind i'm showing you the i'm showing you the posterior aspect of a male urinary bladder why because these are the two structures which are not present in a female bladder these are the seminal vesicles the orange colored structures and the white colored structures are the ductus difference or the vas difference okay so I want you to appreciate the fact that all its course down, the ureter is usually lying vertical, okay? But once they enter the pelvis, for some time they are sort of vertical, and then they change their course. So uh, you have to imagine that 
the pelvic girdle in your, like you have to imagine pelvic girdle in your mind and think about my thumbs as the ischial spines. Okay, so at the level of East, two ischial spines, right and left, these ureters, they change their direction. All of a sudden, a sharp turn, and they become vertical, oh, sorry, horizontal or transverse, okay? So this sharp bend of the ureters inside the pelvic cavity, just above the floor of the pelvis, is at the level of two ischial spines. Okay, now I'll come back to, I will talk about its blood supply, that, you know, it's, it's understandable that the, these tubes are crossing many structures, many organs, so obviously they will be receiving blood supply from multiple sources, directly from the aorta, from the renal artery, from the internal iliac, of course, because when they enter the pelvis, it's the internal iliac artery, which is the sole blood supply to the pelvic organs. So now ureters have become a pelvic structure, a pelvic organ. Hmm? So they will be receiving uh, branches from the internal iliac. And also here, you have to picture in your mind that in females are the two ovaries sitting at just underneath the pelvic brim. So the ovarian arteries, which are coming down from the aorta, will also be giving branches or twigs to the, these ureters in females. Then in here in the pelvis, in females, the uterine artery, which is a, again a branch of internal iliac artery, the uterine and vagi vaginal arteries will be giving off branches to the ureters, okay? Now, in males, there, is no, there are no ovaries. So, the, in the pelvis, they will be supplied by, over here, they'll be supplied by branches from the testi testicular arteries. And here in the pelvis, they will be supplied by the, uh, the branches uh, the, the vessels which are supplying the ductus deferens, okay? So it, the, it, in, in nutshell, ureters receive a very rich blood supply all their way down, okay? I want to mention about the three anatomical or normal structural constrictions present in the path of ureters, each ureter, okay? The first constriction is present at the point where the ureter starts, it commences. That is the ureteropelvic junction. You can see this whitish blue color structure is re representing the renal pelvis, while this yellow tube is the ureter. So at the, the ureteropelvic junction where the ureter is commencing, there is a natural, a normal constriction. Then once they, are, they have reached the pelvic brim and then they are crossing on either side in front of the sacroiliac joints and the, uh, the, the bifurcation of common iliac into internal and external. So they will be crossing the internal iliac arteries or vessels rather. So at that point, there is a constriction, a natural constriction. Then the third and the last constriction would be present at the point where they are entering, they are traversing through the wall of the bladder and dumping the urine inside the bladder cavity. So at the vesico-uretric junction. So we have three normal anatomical constrictions in the path of ureters. Okay, why these constrictions are important to know? Because these are the site, very common sites for the impaction of uretric stones. And also, physiologically, what they are doing in normal circumstances, even if, uh, if somebody doesn't ha is, is not suffering from stones, what they are doing, they are limiting the retrograde flow of urine or reflux of urine back towards the kidney tissue. This is funny because the kidneys are the structures or the organs which are producing the urine, but they are not immune to it because once the urine is sterile, but once the urine reaches the bladder, it's a reservoir, it's, a, you know, it's like a water tank. 
and it has a lot of organisms, normal commensals, normal flora. So once the urine is in the, in the bladder, if it gets back to the kidney tissue, it would be definitely be bringing the organisms with it. And that can cause, you know, uh, renal infection. All right, nephritis. You call it pyelonephritis because the pylos means the, the uh, pelvis or, uh, you know, the dilated part of the ureter. Okay, so pylo means it's an ascending type of infection. It's starting from down, down uh, in the bladder, climbing up as a reflux, retrograde flow, back to the nephric tissue. Okay, so that's not a good condition. All right, so these constrictions are playing a very important role in both ways. Now, um, what else I, will, I have to talk about? related to the ureters is its nerve supply is coming from the ureteric plexus, as I have mentioned, that it's made up of uh, smooth muscles. So they're not under our voluntary control. So they would be innovated by the autonomic nervous system. So the ureteric plexus is basically, it's, a, uh, it's been uh, formed by the abdominal uh, you know, supium mesenteric plexus or the, around the aorta, yeah, there's aortic plexus, uh, a network of sympathetic and parasympathetic fibers. They give off the renal plexus on each side, and the renal plexus will eventually be forming the ureteric plexus, okay? So the, uh, how the ureters are, because they are made up of smooth muscle, so there would be always a peristaltic movement going on on a downward peristaltic movement, okay? How this is happening? Because the moment kidney released the urine into the caliceal system down to the pelvis, and the, from the pelvis, the urine has entered the ureter, okay? The distension of the ureteric lumen or wall will send signals, and those signals will be causing the peristaltis to start and there would be a constant downward movement, okay? We, we usually, in normal circumstances, we don't even feel that movement, just like we don't feel the movement of our GI tract, okay? But in case of obstruction, like in case of a calculus or something, on, or a stricture, narrowing, a, an abnormal narrowing, we would definitely be feeling the pain, okay? Then the, the, there is sensory innovation. Of, obviously, the, the sympathetic limb Will, and parasympathetic limb would be having an afferent element also that would ca be carrying the sensory uh, input from the ureters, okay? Now here I have to talk about the relations also. Uh, in front of you, again, is the, is the male uh, system. So here, when I talk about the relations, Obviously, the ureters are related to the, the ovarian or the testicular artery, which would be a branch down from the uh, uh, descending abdominal aorta, just like the renal artery is. And also, the, the gonadal vein will be in contact with, uh, with the ureter. Here, uh, it's a common phrase they use, that the water over the bridge, as you can see, the bridge is the blood vessel, and the water is in this tube, which is ureter. So the relationship between the internal iliac vessels and the ureter at the pelvic brim is water over the bridge, okay? Then they enter the pelvic cavity, and they, they are related to the two ischial spines in both sexes. And then they change their direction and become horizontal or transverse to open up into the bladder. Here, they are, in, in males, they are crossed by this structure, which you can imagine my finger is completing this structure, that's the ductus deferens, or vas deferens. So they are at just close to the bladder, the, the, the ureters on both sides in males are crossed by, anteriorly crossed by, the ductus deferens or vas deferens. So they are lying under. Okay. While in females, 
there is no ductus deferens, but there is another organ located here just between the bladder and the rectum, that is the uterus. So there is a uterine artery, a major branch of the internal iliac. So the uterine artery is crossing over the ureter, above. So you call it water under the bridge. The artery is the blood vessel, it's the bridge, and the structure that is carrying urine or water is under the bridge, okay? So here, water over the bridge, here, water under the bridge, and it's a very important thing to know when you come to the surgical interventions because it's important to understand the relationship of the ureter with the uterine artery in cases of hysterectomies, you know. Uh, sometimes a surgeon, by mistake, can clamp the ureter instead of the uterine artery, or he can clamp both the structures together if he doesn't know the anatomy well. It's a very, very serious situation because a woman can suffer from renal shutdown. Okay? Done.